So welcome to how to charge the turbocharge, the Cloud Foundry API. Um, I wanted to talk about a problem that I feel like a lot of organizations have, not just with Cloud Foundry, but sort of with dealing with large amounts of applications in general, wherever they may be deployed. And that is, how do you understand meta information about those applications? Not just what's deployed, but the properties, the interesting facts about the application. How can you ask the system uh, what's true about some set of applications? <clears throat> and, uh, and what can we do about that in Cloud Foundry? So hi, I'm John Feminella. I'm a advisor for Pivotal, so I work with mostly financial services and insurance clients, mostly in the Americas. Um, but we, we have a pretty broad portfolio of folks that I talk to. And it's those folks who I think have uh, run into this problem the most. They have very large portfolios. They have very diverse portfolios. Some applications that are really new, some applications that are really old, some applications that are Java, some applications that are .NET, some applications that are Node, uh, totally different levels of sensitivity, and so on. So they are interested in understanding at any given moment like what's actually running in Cloud Foundry and being able to ask questions of Cloud Foundry, uh, you know, tell me how many of these applications are sensitive or tell me what billing code I should use for this particular application and so on. <clears throat> and this is a problem that uh, may not be apparent at first glance. So I want to kind of show you the way that I think about it to maybe reveal what kinds of solutions might be appropriate to it. And then we'll see uh, what I did with a couple of case studies for those clients, and hopefully you can uh, apply them to your own Cloud Foundry foundations. So, like I said, the fundamental problem is one of metadata. And what I mean by that is we're interested in, if we have some application, being able to tell the foundation or foundations uh, about that application, properties that are true that aren't part of the application itself. So for example, you might have like a contact person for an application, um, and you might want to tell Cloud Foundry, hey, the contact person for this application is Bob or Alice. You might have a billing code for the application that describes how the foundation should charge back money to whichever line of business is deploying that application. So that's another fact about the application you'd like to store uh, you know, close to Cloud Foundry, ideally. Uh, and then you know you, you may also have things like uh, the details about the sensitivity of the application. Does it contain classified information or personally identifiable information that might be subject to higher levels of regulatory or auditing and compliance scrutiny? So all of these things are facts, are examples of facts that we would like to record about the application with the application, or at least very close to it. So we have some, you know, we have that application. Now it's not good enough just to store those facts, right? Because later we want to be able to ask a question like who's the billing contact for this particular application? Or maybe you want to ask a question not just of one application at a time, but a set of applications, maybe all the applications running on the whole foundation. Which of these applications contains sensitive information? I need to make sure that they're on this isolation segment. Or which of these applications has this billing code because we're going through a financial restructuring and we have to send that charge code to somebody else. So there are lots of kinds of questions you might be interested in asking, not just of one application, but of, of many different applications. And you might have many different kinds of questions you want to ask your foundation. And ideally, we have some mechanism by which we can verify that the facts that we said before about the application are or are not true for a specific application. So that works for like one or two or three applications at a time, but what happens if you have a lot of applications, right? Now we're maybe going to rely on something like the APIs that are provided by the foundation to make sure that we can answer those questions. Um, but there's some problems with that. So let's say that we have a collection, not just one application, but many applications running on our foundation, right? And let's say that some of those applications have a property that we're interested in. Maybe it's uh, an application with a specific billing code, for example. And we'd like to find all the applications in our foundation that have that property, that, uh, uh, that have the property of interest. So the, all the applications with such and such billing code, or all the applications with Alice as the contact, and so on. So we, again, have some way of identifying those applications. We are querying something. We don't know what it is yet, but we're querying something to get us the answer to that question. And then ideally, we get some set of query results that is, in fact, the set of applications that that, that represents. 
So the kinds of questions, like I said before, that we might be interested in are things like chargeback, who gets billed for this application, or contact info, who's the responsible party, or the security contact, who, do, who gets notified for this application if there's a breach. Maybe you have a global security contact, like security at mycompany.com for, uh, for vulnerabilities, but maybe you have a specific contact for that application that needs to be notified. Maybe you have questions about sensitivity, which applications use personally identifiable information, or uh, in the US, which, which applications are sub uh, uh, subject to HIPAA regulations, or uh, uh, regulations about how we store healthcare data and private information about people getting medical treatment. Or maybe even more technically, which applications are using a particular dependency? Maybe you're interested in tracking something like um, when I say dependency, I don't mean something like the, the root FS, but rather something like um, among all of my Java applications or all of my Python applications, you know, they use this specific library. Uh, it might be interesting to track which of those applications has those dependencies, but if later we get a CBE about that specific library, I'll be able to tell all the, all the owners of those applications, hey, you have a vulnerability in this, and we know that, you, uh, that, you're, that you're using this library. <clears throat> So it sounds like, a, I think, a useful ability to have. So a natural question might be, can we get this in Cloud Foundry? So the way that metadata kind of works in Cloud Foundry right now is that it doesn't. Um, so the, the closest thing that you can really get is the manifest. And it seems like a, maybe a natural place to put this information. Like you'd want to, you know, we already described properties about the application in the manifest, maybe that's a reasonable place to put some of this metadata. And so you might have something like, okay, maybe there's a, a, a metadata section that we add to the manifest. Um, so how, how might something like that work? <clears throat> well, when you see push with that manifest, you know, of course, we're gonna zip up the, the directory and everything that, that you're pushing from. And then we're also gonna include all the manifest data. And then together, that will form a, a payload that we'll send to the Cloud Controller API. And so that payload is going to uh, you know, go over HTTP, oh, HTTP to the uh, Cloud Controller API. Um, but what happens when it gets there is that the manifest isn't actually stored anywhere. Instead, the manifest is read for properties that match one of a set of uh, named keys. And anything that's not in that set of named keys is just dropped. So you can have anything you want in the manifest, even if Cloud Foundry doesn't know what to do with that. And that won't be a problem, but those properties will not be stored anywhere. So the Cloud Controller API is not remembering anything that we put in the manifest. So this doesn't really work, even though that seems like it would be a great place to put it, it's not really going to be useful for our purposes. So if we can't use the manifest, what are the strategies we could use if we wanted this sort of flavor of, of capability? <clears throat> now, whatever strategy we come up with, we'd want it to basically have three properties, I think. We don't want it to be invasive to a user's workflow. So we don't want the user to have to do something weird or different about pushing applications just because we've turned or enabled, turned this feature on or enabled it in some way in our foundation. If people have to totally change how they push apps, we're probably not making their lives better, right? We're probably complicating things for the sake of adding this feature. Um, so we also want the experience to be seamless in that Ideally, there should be API compatibility. Like, we don't want to do something that if, uh, if there's some other downstream tool chain that doesn't know about the fact that, we're, that we've got this capability turned on, what we don't want is a situation where now that we turn that feature on, we've broken some tool like Concourse that depends on a specific uh, uh, response or uh, 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 the API response. Uh, whatever that format is or whatever that structure is, we don't want to break that in our future responses. And we also don't want querying. So when we ask questions, we don't want to have to ask the question of each application in turn. So if we have 5,000 applications, we don't want to have to ask 5,000 questions. We want to ask one question to all the applications simultaneously. So we wouldn't probably be satisfied with a approach where we want to know, like, show me all the applications that have Alice as a contact, and then that requires I have to ask each of the 5,000 applications one at a time. That probably wouldn't be a good experience. We'd want to be able to ask one, we want to send one API request and get one API response back with ideally all of the applications that uh, match our criteria. So. Uh, 
I helped write a, a proposal that has been shipped to CF Dev, which uh, the link is in the slides, which I've uploaded, and you can read more about that later. But essentially, the proposal is to, uh, is to make it such that if you have an API resource, whether that's an organization, an application, a space, et cetera, whatever that, uh, I'm using resource here in the restful sense of the word resource. And whenever, whenever you have a resource of, of, of something that the cloud controller API tracks or is aware of, ideally we should be able to put metadata on that. Um, and th that metadata could start out really simple, it's just like a label tagging sort of system of just this key, this value. But, but th that's sort of the first maybe place to start. <clears throat> That's not here yet, though. So if you wanted this, what, what would you do? Um, so the first thing you might try is something like environment variables. Like, that seems pretty close to having a key value store. And in fact, because that's part of the recognized structure of the manifest, we will get that stored in the cloud controller or through the cloud controller API. So it won't be discarded. It will actually be stored. So you might say, OK, well, that's, that's going to work, because obviously you can set environment variables, and obviously you can use that as a key value store. Now, what are the problems with that, though? So one problem is that you've, made infor you've added information about the application, facts about the application, that require that application to restart. Right, so you've said, oh, the billing contact for, or the billing charge code for this application has changed. It's now X instead of Y. Well, in order for that to actually take hold, you have to restart the application. But nothing about what we're telling the application here has anything to do with the state that would be needed by the application itself. It's not like we're wiring up a service or we're changing some property the application depends on. In fact, there are no references to this environment variable probably within the application. So if that's true, then that seems kind of a bad idea to make applications have to restart just because we added some metadata. Um, that's also bad because if I'm an operator, ideally I'd like to be able to set metadata that you don't have to care about, right? Like maybe you as a developer, you don't get to decide what the billing charge code is. Maybe that's something that the organization decides. And maybe you shouldn't even be allowed to change the billing charge code, right? You shouldn't be able to change your bill to get paid by somebody else. So if that's true, then you probably don't want to use environment variables for that because if you can set one environment variable, then you can set any environment variable. So that's probably not the right place to put this. You know, it would technically work, but not ideal. So another approach would be, what if we wrote a CF CLI plugin that shadowed push? So in other words, what if you installed a plugin that somehow like overwrote the push command with this new version that would like siphon off the part that had the metadata and then store it somewhere? So what if you could say, for example, CF push and then some extra variables at the end that would be interpreted as metadata in, in some form. So you could do that, but that's actually not, you could write the plugin that is, but you wouldn't be able to actually install it because you can't shadow uh, CF CLI commands. So you can't overwrite push or uh, you know, bind service or anything that's a CF CLI command. So oh yeah, if that doesn't work, then maybe the next best thing is what if we write a plugin, but you don't shadow it, so you have to change your workflow then, right? So you're not typing CF push anymore, you're typing CF metadata push or something like that. And then, you know, that, that could work, but, you know, again, now we're asking people to change their workflow. Every place that we'd use that API would have to be updated, right? Every place in my continuous integration pipeline that was pushing applications to Cloud Foundry, I'd now have to also say something like, uh, yeah, please use CF metadata push instead of push, right? So, you know, it would technically work, but again, not the greatest idea just because, uh, well, first of all, you have, to, uh, uh, you have to convince everybody to install this plugin, right? I mean, now you have 5,000 developers making sure that we, they all do that correctly, keeping their plugins up to date, so you kind of have a, a different sort of a problem. But again, it technically would work. So all of, the, all of these approaches that I've described before that technically would work, uh, they kind of fail that third test, though, which is that we don't want querying to require enumeration, right? So you can get the data in there into Cloud Foundry, but when you want to get it out again, there's no API that says, show me all of these, you know, show me all the applications that have this property. And you can't reach in and monkey with the eternals of the, or, I mean, you can, I guess, if you wanted to recompile it yourself, but, you know, you, 
a typical platform operator doesn't do that. So they're taking the package as is, and they're running Cloud Foundry as is. So they're not going to have the ability, not going to have the ability to do this third part. So is there a way to kind of do that third part? Um, and the answer is yes, there is. It requires a little bit more elbow grease than the, than the approaches we've seen before. And this is one that, that, that we used in a case study that I'm going to describe later. So the way this works is that you, um, everything's the same from the developer experience, so nobody changes anything about that. But the, the endpoint, the Cloud Foundry API endpoint, is proxied through an HTTP proxy before you actually get to talk to it. So it's almost like there's a route service interposing in the way. But whenever somebody says CF push or CF anything, they're really making a HTTP request to the uh, Cloud Controller API endpoint, right? So when they do that, they're hitting an HTTP endpoint. So that means that if you're hitting an HTTP endpoint, you can also proxy HTTP. And what this proxy does is it looks at any, um, it looks at any information in the manifest that you've sent over and it will check, to, uh, it, it will uh, read the manifest first before it gets to the actual Cloud Foundry API. So there's a step in the middle that looks at your manifest and decides if there's metadata in there that you're updating or changing or whatever. Um, and then this step is owned by the continuous integration pipeline. So people aren't typically pushing their applications directly to some production foundation. They're maybe like, updating a, a source control somewhere, and then that triggers a continuous integration pipeline, which then triggers a push to the production foundation. Um, but importantly, this, can, this pipeline all stores the metadata that's been extracted from the manifest into its own separate data store. It has nothing to do with Cloud Foundry. So it's separate. Wherever you would store the rest of the information about your application in the continuous integration pipeline, you're also storing some additional metadata about that. And this is, this is a, I would say, a fairly natural fit for most organizations because they often use things like Artifactory or some other uh, repository of like stuff that represents the inventory of all their applications. And so it's usually a fairly simple matter to say, oh yeah, well, I'm also going to store some extra key value pairs in my Artifactory or in some entirely new data store. Um, so that takes care of, the, that takes care of the, the, the storage part. How do we get the querying part? Um, there's a couple of ways to do that. Uh, in the case study, we wrote a small API shim that all it does is uh, provide a few Boolean type operators for being able to ask questions for this data store. But depending on what that data store was, you could very easily just use the continuous integrations pipe, uh, use that data store's um, native operators directly. So for example, if that's MongoDB, there's a I would say a fairly expressive set of operators you could already use, or if it's Redis, there's a fairly expressive set of operators you could already use. But we wanted to put something in front of it so that no matter what you chose as the storage engine, you would have this sort of, uh, as long as you used a compatible storage engine, uh, no matter what that was, you'd have some way of sort of uh, querying the, uh, the data store where the metadata was. And so we just wrote this very small API shim. It's about uh, 400 lines of, of Go. So if you want to ask a question now in the future, you, uh, you just use that API shim. So later, when, after you've pushed the metadata, after you've updated something, um, now you want to say, show me all the applications that have Alice as a contact, or show me all the things that have such and such person as, the, uh, uh, such and such person as a security contact, or this billing chargeback code, et cetera, uh, then that's, you're going to use the API shim to do that. So how did this work? So we. So what I did was I sort of proposed this idea to folks who were interested in the CF dev proposal, but were not able to, uh, you know, they wanted it now, basically. They didn't want to wait for the proposal to be implemented. So I said, well, okay, the proposal isn't, isn't implemented yet. Here are some strategies we could try. Um, and we basically went through a list of the, the stuff in section two that I told you about, and I kind of rejected all of them except the proxy approach. <clears throat> and... Um, and, and what we tried for our trial methodology was these three firms that expressed this interest. 
and we, I asked them for one non-production foundation and one production foundation each. So let's try it in non-production, and let's try it in production, under the hypothesis that the kinds of questions you might be interested in asking about non-production applications are different than the kinds of questions you might be asking about production applications. So we wanted to make sure that if they were doing those kinds of queries that we sort of covered our bases on both, on both fronts. Um, there's a fairly, um, you know, fairly broad range of uh, number of instances that were covered by, uh, by each firm. So although they were each doing one non-production and one production foundation, so the number of foundations was the same, the number of application instances being covered by those foundations was quite different, about a 2.5x to 3x difference between the smallest and the largest. <clears throat> and they also chose different data stores. So one chose etcd, which is a fairly simple key value store. Uh, Raft consensus, all of that stuff, so, you know, clustering. Um, and then the other two chose Redis. Uh, again, relatively straightforward key value store, much better querying and um, much better, I would say, higher level sophistication in terms of the operators you can use than you can use with FCD. And so what, what actually happened? So, so they basically all followed the structure I showed you before. Everybody is exactly the same API shim. Everybody is exactly, uh, everybody's their own separate continuous integration pipeline, but they're all using a different data store or, or they're choosing which data store to use. Um, and for the trial, we basically said you can have either SCD or Redis. So they had to choose one of those two. Um, so, so how did this work out? So the... The mean query time was the time it took to ask questions and get responses as compared to the baseline of record everything as environment variables, which I thought was the closest thing that would be worth comparing to in terms of what you can do right now in Cloud Foundry with no work. Uh, that was about a thousand times faster than using the API because you don't have to enumerate all of the different applications to get to an answer. You can ask one question and get the answer. So instead of waiting, you know, if you had 450 instances, you have to ask each one of those 400, or four, if you have 450 applications, you have to ask each one of those 450 applications, do you have this environment variable? Do you have this environment variable? Do you have that environment variable? And so on. There's no way to query and mass environment variables as a key value. Um, and you certainly can't do things like show me which applications uh, lack an environment variable or show me which applications uh, have an environment variable whose value partially matches the substring, that sort of thing. When we, so we did this for about eight weeks. Uh, I mean, at the end of the eight weeks, we said, how's it going? Um, how's your, how's the strategy working out for you? And the result was about 94% approval that most people said, almost all people said that we would want to continue using it. And all three of the firms said that they are rolling it out to all of the rest of their production foundations. So there's nothing that really changes on the foundation side. All you do is add more things to the list of endpoints that are being proxied uh, and then sent to the, uh, and then sent to this data store. <clears throat> so these firms are really excited about this approach because I think it gives them a capability that they don't have today, which is really valuable. If you look at Kubernetes or, uh, or CFCR, you're seeing, I mean, you see people take advantage of the fact that Kubernetes has tagging and labels all the time on their applications. It's like a, a very heavily used feature. Once you get above a set, once you get above a, a sort of the number of pods or number of instances that you can kind of keep in your head at the same time, which is everybody running a production foundation of any reasonable size, then you start needing to be able to ask questions like, which of these applications has this property? And so that's why you see people in CFCR and Kubernetes using those, that, that capability. So the fact that we don't have it in CFAR or, uh, or in the Cloud Controller API specifically, I think represents an opportunity. And I think we're realizing that by implementing the CFDev proposal I talked about before. So I think there's a reason that all of these firms are excited by that, because it's a capability that is needed by operators to be able to provide this as a service to their users. So thanks very much for listening. Um, if you have questions, I think we have about four minutes to take them. I know there's a microphone that might be floating around, but if not, I will listen to your questions and then repeat them for the benefit of the camera. Any questions? Going once. Do you have a um, sample of your implementation on, uh, available on G GitHub or something? 
so the, the API shim is available. The, um, the proxy implementation is specific to the, the three firms. I'm working on extracting that out of, the, uh, out, out of their specific implementations. So you can see that on GitHub at, uh, at uh, github.com slash fj slash uh, CF, uh, CF API shim. So I will, I'll update my slides to include a link to that on, on this slide. And maybe one further, further question. Um, you talked about um, the attributes being provided via the manifest and extracted by your API mm -hmm. scheme. Yep. Uh, how do you ensure that, for instance, the cost center you're referring to is not um, um, manipulated by the developers? I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question. How does it ensure that? Um, you talked about um, there are properties which are um, set by operators in contrast mm -hmm. to set by developers, like the cost center you're yeah. charging to. And when you're extracting information from manifest, yes. it's, it's, it's provided by developers. Oh, so, so the, um, right, so a couple of things. The, the API can be used by developers through the manifest, but, but, but operators also get to use it. And because it's controlled by the continuous integration pipeline, they get to act last. Right, so in other words, if you try to set a property, you can do that in the manifest, but then it will get overridden by the continuous integrations idea of, 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 of what the correct value for that property is. So you can say, my billing charge code is one, two, three, four, five in the manifest, but the authoritative source isn't your manifest, it's the continuous integration pipeline's understanding of what the correct value of that is. Um, certainly the operator could make a mistake, like nothing would stop you from doing that, but, um, but, but, but there's no role-based access control or anything. It's just if you, uh, it's predicated on a notion that if you're a developer pushing, you're going to be using the continuous integration pipeline to do that. You don't have direct access to the foundation as a result. <laughs> yes. Uh, I had a question because these uh, metadata features has been asked for a long time by users. I was... Uh, and I'm surprised that uh, now uh, that we're trying to pollinate with things like Kubernetes. As you said, that's native, tags are native feature of uh, Kubernetes and your solution does not seem in the core cloud foundry. We'd expect uh, a tag to be first level citizen inside the core cloud foundry and being able to tag and the solution you propose seems around the core of cloud foundry. Uh, do you have any, any insight of why we don't tackle this inside the, the API and the data model of Cloud Foundry? Um, I'm sorry. Could you, so I, I think I understood the question. I think I understood the last part of your question. But is, is it why? Uh, could you sort of repeat that in one question for me? Just, I'm not sure I just understood. Just uh, uh, I wanted to understand why we work around the, the, the issue, which is real. It's a lack in Cloud Foundry, and we all managing it with uh, proxies and things like this. Yes. Whereas we expect that feature metadata to be core in Cloud Foundry inside the API, inside the database, so we have something consistent, I think. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still, I couldn't quite understand the rest of that. I'm still recovering from a little bit of a cold, but I think you're asking uh, w w what's the relationship essentially between the proxy and the developer, like why do we use it that way? to get the metadata? Is that, is that what I'm understanding? Uh, no, no, no. I was asking why we need a proxy. Why do you need a proxy? Why, why not just change the API and the data model of Cloud Oh, Foundry? why don't you just send the data to the, uh, to, to the API directly? Because that would require developers to change their workflow, right? Because if you, if you did like CF push, uh, but you had to do it in a special way to get the metadata on there, well, then you have to change your workflow. So I, I wanted all three of those properties. Like, you don't change your workflow, it's seamless, and querying doesn't require enumeration. So that would break the first rule. If, if I didn't have the proxy there, then developers would have to do something different to get their data into the data store. So that's, that's why the proxy exists at all. Oh, like, like, like uh, yeah, so uh, why, why isn't that just part of the official API? Oh, I think that's the CF dev proposal. That, that's what that would be. 
Okay, so like that, the proposal that's doesn't where exist I yet. Understood it as well. At the moment, it's this proxy, right? At the moment, it's this proxy. Right. At the moment, it's a proxy. Yeah. The CFDF proposal would make it so that you don't need the proxy because it would be part of the API. But because the CFDF proposal is not yet here, and because Fortune 500 firms are impatient, they said, "How can we get this now?" So that's the reason for the proxy. That would all go away when, if the CFDF proposal that I mentioned is implemented. You're absolutely right. Like, you don't need the proxy at all if it's part of the API. But we don't have the API yet. So this is the next best thing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I can't hear you at all without the microphone. Um, do you have an idea when this will be available in the API? Uh, oh boy, I don't know that I can comment, or I, I don't know the answer at all to, uh, okay. to future schedules or anything. I do know that Zach Robinson, who is uh, leading part of that effort, is here at CF Summit, so he would be a good person to talk to. Um, what's the state of this proposal? Is this still in discussion? Can we contribute anything to it, or is it already closed and... Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question one more time? Um, the proposal you mentioned yes. um, for changing the Cloud Controller yes. API, in what state is it? Is it still open for discussion, or is it finished and waiting for review? So I believe it was published in June or May. Um, don't quote me on that, but I think it was published earlier this summer. Uh, I am sure uh, you know, it's still open for discussion, but my understanding is it's being actively worked on um, at this point. That's my understanding. Yeah. Thank you. So if you follow the link in that slide to the proposal, you'll be able to see the actual Google document that has uh, the people's comments and stuff like that. And then um, I did not include a link to the mailing list post where it was discussed, but there's also a small thread on, on that as well. All right, I think we're a little over time. So if you have more questions, I'd be happy to stay afterwards and talk to you. But otherwise, I hope you enjoy the rest of CF Summit.